Okay, great. Um, cool. So this is a, a talk called a deep dive into Bitcoin mechanics. My name is Matthew Zipkin. This is my email, my PGP key. I work for a company called impervious.com. Um, we're a team of engineers working on Bitcoin and Handshake, contributing cypherpunk uh, open source development uh, to these projects. Bitcoin sounds like everybody gets kind of familiar with. Handshake is a new project. It's about a year old. It works almost exactly like Bitcoin, but it has um, a DNS root zone. So it's about domain names uh, on, a, on a new blockchain. Um, so the way that I've designed this talk is to explain some basic Bitcoin mechanics using kind of some fun metaphors. Um, the target audience is developers who are just starting to learn about Bitcoin. Um, and so the technical terms are going to be abstract and in some cases kind of wrong. So don't, you know, uh, th that's the disclaimers. Don't, don't hold me to this if something doesn't define exactly correctly. But I just kind of want to convey these like ge more general concepts. Um, and for, for some of you, this may this material might be too basic, but I'm hoping that you will find the way that I describe these things um, useful. So so hopefully everyone here is either just learning about Bitcoin or um, needs better tools to help explain Bitcoin to their friends and their coworkers and stuff. And so that's kind of how I plan to talk about it. Okay, so what is Bitcoin? Um, maybe someone has asked you this question. And b before I answer it, I'm going to ask a different question, which is what is email? Um, and I have three definitions for the word email. One is it's a unit of correspondence, like, oh, I sent you an email, or I have 10 new emails today. Um, two is it's a computer program. I use Gmail for my email. Outlook is my favorite email program. And three is it's a, it's a network of computers running that computer program and following a protocol. And so uh, what I mean by that is that, uh, is that computers on a network f that, that create email, they send messages to each other, um, with the goal of, of sending emails to, to and from users, and, and they have to follow a protocol. That protocol is called SMTP, an email. And one example is like emails have to have a from and a to. Uh, otherwise, it's just not, you're just not doing email if you're not doing it correctly. Um, so an email is, you know, it's a single message, it's a computer program, and it's a network. And Bitcoin is also kind of the same three things, um, broadly, of course. Um, one is it's a unit of monetary value. Uh, that coffee costs 0 0.01 Bitcoin. I think that would be a very expensive coffee these days, but, you know, or I get paid in Bitcoin. So Bitcoin is a unit of money. Um, it's also a computer program. I use Bitcoin Core for my Bitcoin full node and for my wallet. Or Bitcoin is a Bitcoin full node written in JavaScript. And finally, it's a network of computers running that program and following a protocol. So um, two of the rules in the Bitcoin protocol, uh, you know, one is that nobody can spend money they don't have. And another rule is that the total supply of Bitcoin will, will never exceed 21 million BTC. So right off the bat, kind of broadly, like email, Bitcoin have these similarities that, that the word means, you know, a single thing. It means a computer program and it means a network of, of computers running that program. And that network is based on a protocol with rules. Some are stricter than others. So um, if we're talking about email again, uh, email servers connect to other email servers and follow rules to maintain a database of messages for the user to enable that um, user to, to send and receive messages. So here we've got um, some, some people you might recognize, Bart, Homer, Lisa, and Nelson. They are each running email servers on their computer, and they each have um, a unique database. Homer has his database of his emails. Nelson has his database of his emails and like that. So. The four people here have different databases, but they're all running similar software, and those computers are all um, talking to each other over the internet with the goal of maintaining that database for those users. Um, and some messages are, uh, are just straight up invalid. So for example, if Bart sends Homer an email that has a to and a from and a subject and a message, uh, that's an acceptable message for the email protocol, and Homer will receive that message and his computer will say, hey, you just got an email from Bart. Uh, meanwhile, Nelson is screwing around over here, and he tries to send a message to Homer that breaks the rules. It doesn't have a from, doesn't have a subject, it doesn't even have a message. It has a to, which is part of, part of the battle, but everything else is gibberish. So in this case, Homer's computer is going to reject that message. It breaks the rules. We don't want to talk to Nelson. Maybe even his computer blocks Nelson's IP address, that kind of thing. This is the idea of a protocol running on a network with rules. <coughs> so taking it back to Bitcoin, the way that we want... Bitcoin to work is we want everybody on the network to have the same database. And that's where we start to really start diverging from this idea of like email and Bitcoin are kind of similar. 
Um, so in this illustration, we've got Bart, Homer, Lisa, and Nelson, and their computers are all running software, and their computers are all sending messages to each other over the internet, but all four of these people have the exact same database. Um, and you know that's what we'll call the global ledger or whatever, and this is how we can do this global money concept. So let's start a bank, okay? Everyone on this call has got some software experience. We've all written some kind of computer programs before. Today, we're gonna write a bank computer program. Um, as simple as possible. It's a database and it's got three uh, fields in it. So, you know, let's write this in MySQL or something. The only thing we need to keep track of is a table of usernames, passwords, and a balance. So I've got Bart, Lisa, Homer, Nelson, and Bart has a password, don't have a cow man. He's got 15, whatever. Lisa's got 100 and like that. Um, when a transaction, so how we would um, use this database, we're also gonna have users send us transactions. And a transaction, for example, might look like this. Um, a transaction comes through with a username, a password, a recipient's username, and an amount. So this is an example transaction of Bart sending Lisa two units. And Bart sends this message to our bank. And um, the bank looks at this transaction and says, okay, the password is correct. Don't have a cow man is the correct password. Um, Bart has a sufficient balance to send two bucks to Lisa. And so we can modify the database and change it in the way that I've illustrated below. So the table on the left is how we start. Then this transaction comes through and the table on the right is where we end up. Bart's balance goes from 15 to 13. Lisa's balance goes from 100 to 102. That's how we do it. We've got a database, we've got a transaction that modifies the database. Um, the problem with this model is that we need to keep this column right here, password, extremely safe. It can't be public. It can't be shared. It can only be modified by the central authority, the bank. You know, we don't want anyone to know anyone else's password. Otherwise, the whole system falls apart, which means we're going to end up with an architecture like this. There's really only one database. It's at the bank. No one else has access to it because um, if they did, they could basically send each other, steal each other's money. So um, this is not Bitcoin, not how Bitcoin works. Is there a question? Talking too fast. Okay. Sorry about that. I'm going to try to slow down. Um, <laughs> sorry, got a little too excited. Okay. So uh, hopefully everybody sort of understands um, what I'm getting at with like having a, a database for our banking system. Now to uh, get to our goal of everybody having the same database uh, instead of different databases, or instead of having one database that's just stored at a bank, we're going to start talking about cryptography. And this is where things are going to get interesting. So in the next couple slides, I'm going to uh, loosely define a few terms from cryptography. And some of these things Bitcoin does use and some it doesn't use. But I want to explain them all just so we have an idea of like how all these things work, because some things are going to be more familiar. So symmetric encryption is when Bart and Lisa have the same key. Um, my sister used to pass notes to her classmates in school. They had a little key where the letters were all switched out with little symbols, and they all had the same key, and they could use this key to both encrypt and decrypt messages. So in this picture, Bart and Lisa each have the same key. Um, when a message is encrypted, it looks totally random. It looks like total random noise, like this picture of static I have here. Um, you can't tell anything about it. There's no pattern to it. Uh, without the key, um, you can't do anything. Um, Nelson is here in the middle. He doesn't have a key. He can get a copy of this noise, perhaps, but he can't do anything with it. He cannot reverse the encryption algorithm without the key. Lisa, however, has the key, and so she can take the noisy mess and subtract the key and get the message out. So in th this illustration, I've got Bart on the left. He has a message. He combines it with his key, and he gets random noise that Nelson cannot decrypt. Uh, Lisa gets the noise, subtracts the key, the exact same key, and she gets the message out. This is called symmetric encryption because it's the same key, but Bart and Lisa both have the same key. This is not used in Bitcoin, but I bring it up because when people think about cryptography and encryption, this is one of the models they think of, but actually this does not happen in Bitcoin. Here's something else called asymmetric uh, encryption. Bart and Lisa have different keys. You'll see Bart's got the gold key, yellow has the black key with the yellow background. Um, this is a special kind of encryption. Bart can encrypt messages to Lisa um, that Lisa can decrypt like the last slide, but Lisa is the only person that can decrypt this message. Um, the messages still look like random noise. Nelson still can't decrypt it. And actually in this case, Bart can't even decrypt it either. 
only Lisa can decrypt it. So it's asymmetric because now we have um, two different keys. They're not symmetrical. Um, and in this picture, Bart starts with a message and he adds a public key and gets this random noise that nobody can understand or know anything about. Lisa takes that noise and adds her private key and gets the message out. This is, for example, um, how like Edward Snowden would send secret messages to Glenn Greenwald to talk about the things that he had um, learned about the U.S. government. And this is how we can, you know, when your browser talks to a server, this is one of the ways that things are encrypted. You have this uh, asymmetric um, encryption pattern. This is also not used in Bitcoin, but we're getting closer. So asymmetric authentication, this is kind of a term that I made up, but it's going to make sense. Um, there's still two different keys. There's a private key and a public key. Um, but in this case, we're not actually converting anything to noise. What we're doing is creating a signature, the same way you would uh, sign your name on a piece of paper. So Lisa can sign the message with her private key, and anybody with Lisa's public key can verify that signature, can verify that uh, Lisa must have signed this message. If we assume that Lisa is the only person in the world with this private key, the black key on the yellow background, then anybody with their public key, the golden key on the right, can verify that she signed a message. So Lisa creates a message. She combines it with her private key to get a signed message, the emoji with the pencil. And then Bart and Nelson, who each have copies of her public key, can verify that yes, this message came from Lisa. Um, this is important and it's a really important part of, of Bitcoin, um, this ability to sign messages. Okay, and then the last thing is a little bit more abstract, and this, this is also really interesting. So a hash function um, is kind of like encryption, but there are no keys. I say that it's like encryption in the sense that the output is random noise. You can't uh, decrypt it. Like it doesn't, there's no patterns to it. It just looks like noise. Um, you can't infer anything about it. Um, the emoji I've used to represent it here is the little chemistry set. I really like this because it, it's irreversible, you know? It's like cooking something. You can't, can't put that hash back into that glass bottle and get something else out. Um, the input to a hash function can be any type of data, any size of data. You can put the entire the Constitution of the United States into a hash function. You can put the Bible, you can put a single word, you can put a single bit. Um, the output is always the same size. Um, for example, the output of a hash function might always be 32 bytes. The output is impossible to predict. It always is just this noisy random mess. Uh, there's no way to reverse it. Like I said, if you're given this random noisy mess, there's no decryption, absolutely none. There's no way to reverse a hash, and that's going to be very important later. But what's interesting about it is it's deterministic. The same input will always produce the same output, and any slightly different input will produce a totally different output. So in this picture, I've got um, Bart and Lisa. Bart has uh, a red chart and he hashes it and he gets this orange random noise. Lisa has the exact same red chart. She hashes it with the same function. She gets the exact same output. So in this sense, Lisa can verify um, the output of Bart's hash function. Meanwhile, Nelson, he's got this chart with a blue line. When he hashes it, he gets a totally different hash, totally unrecognizable. Okay, so um, really quick, we talked about four cryptographic principles. There's symmetric encryption, where uh, Bart and Lisa have the same key and they can send messages to each other encrypted. There's asymmetric encryption, where Bart and Lisa have different keys and Bart can send an encrypted message to Lisa. There's asymmetric, asymmetric authentication, where Lisa can prove that she signed a message and everyone else can verify it. And there's hash functions, where you take a piece of data and basically destroy it in an irreversible way. Um, so, a user can prove that they know the private key connected with a public key. And we have this method of irreversibly, unpredictably, uh, and deterministically compressing data. So these are our four cryptographic principles. And I'm going to check the chat really here to see if there's any questions, if anybody wants to uh, ask anything about the crypto stuff before I move on. Okay, I'll check the chat again later just to make sure everyone is, uh, is doing okay. Okay, so now we're gonna take uh, these crypto principles and we're gonna go back to our bank. And, and this time we're gonna create a database for our, our bank, but it's gonna be using this cryptographic stuff. Um, so instead of having a username, a password, and a balance, now we're just gonna have a public key and a balance. So take a look at this chart. I've got four um, 
public keys, these little pieces of data, and each public key has a balance associated with it. This is our database. Um, and if someone wants to send a transaction, the transaction will look like this. The sender uh, provides their public key, they provide the public key of the recipient, they provide the amount they wanna transfer, and they provide a signature. So remember, Lisa signed her, her little message with um, her private key in a way that no one else in the world can do because she's the only one with a private key. But everyone in the world can verify that Lisa actually signed it because we have her public key. And so in this sense, um, the message that Lisa would sign would be the first three fields. So the, the sender public key, the recipient public key, and the amount. And that's her message, and she signs it and sends that, um, sends that to us, sends that to the world. Uh, and then the database will verify that the signature was valid, cryptographically speaking, and that the balance for that public key was sufficient. And then we do the transaction similar to how we did before. So uh, on the left, uh, the, the public key that starts 0 to BA has a balance of 15. Um, and uh, they transfer two units to the public key um, 1100. And they start with the balance 0 and goes up to 102. So. Now we have a signed message and we can move the balance from one account to the other. Um, just using cryptography and signatures, no username, no password. Okay, so now we're getting closer to where we want to be with, with Bitcoin. Now we have a way that uh, Bart, Homer, Lisa, and Nelson can each run their own computers, sending messages to each other over the internet, and they can all maintain the same database because there's not really any sensitive information in that database. There's no passwords in the database. Uh, all four of these characters have their own private keys. Bart key, Bart's key is green, Homer's is yellow, Lisa's is blue, Nelson's is red. They have their own keys. They keep those safe. And they can sign these messages to each other. Everyone else um, verifies the messages and updates their database accordingly. Now everyone's got the same database. So again, this is not actually how Bitcoin works. We're getting there. We're getting closer, but we're still not quite there. Um, it's worth pointing out, however, that this account-based model... <clears throat> is how some cryptocurrencies work. Uh, in particular, Ethereum uses an account-based model. So we're getting close to Bitcoin, but Bitcoin doesn't actually work this way. And this is where we're going to start to get um, into something really interesting about one of the properties of Bitcoin. Okay, so here's where we're going to pivot. Um, when we're talking about uh, the username and password model, um, and even the, the public key signature model, kind of, um, we're looking at the picture on the left. Um, Venmo, PayPal, whatever your banking website looks like, you put in a username and a password, and that's how you are allowed to make transactions. Um, and that's a, that's a reasonably good model, and Ethereum kind of uses that model too with that cryptography that I described. But I want to change your mindset now, and let's look at the picture on the right. Um, what I've got here is a, sort of a different way to think about money. Um, what we have here are three units of money. Each unit has a different value and an identifier. Um, these are, you know, 10, 5, and $1 bills. So there's three units there. They have different values, 10, 5, and 1, and they each have different identifiers. And in this case, the, the $1 bill has an identifier B23825863. Okay. So, um, so let's start to think about money, not in terms of accounts and balances, but in terms of cash and like these little pieces of money that have identifiers and values. Now we're starting to get to what the Bitcoin database actually looks like. Um, and it sort of looks like this. Um, instead of tracking accounts and balances, we're gonna um, track little bits of money like dollar bills. And so each of these lines in the, in the database is a, a coin or a bill or a unit or whatever. And they each have an identifier, a value and a challenge. Um, so the examples that I've written here in the, in, in the challenge section are like sign this identifier with public key 02BA03DD. Um, and we know from the little crypto definitions that I provided you guys earlier that like you take a message um, and you can sign it. So where we're going to go with this is that I have a, a, a coin with an identifier B118DF07. It's worth 101.3 Bitcoins. And it has this thing called a challenge. And the challenge says, sign that identifier with this public key. What are we gonna do with that? I'll show you. So the way that we do transactions in this system is we destroy coins and create new coins. So instead of updating your balance in the database, I'm gonna completely erase one of, the, one of the coins and create more coins. 
So the transaction looks like this. There's two arrays in the transaction. One is a list of, of coins to destroy, and the other is a list of new coins to create. Um, so when, to identify a coin we want to destroy, we provide it with an identifier and a response to the challenge. And then we are allowed to create coins. And so I have another list here uh, where I'm creating two coins. One has a value of 10, and the challenge is uh, signed with this public key BA09. And the other is a coin with a value of nine, and the challenge is signed with this pub key 1100. So we put this all together. Um, this is how the transaction is going to interact with our database. Um, we look at the, at the coins we're going to destroy, and we find that coin in the database, identifier 62A03142. It does exist. It's in the database. It's valid. Um, then we look at the challenge, sign with pub key 1100. Okay, we've got that challenge. We've got the public key. We look at the response in the transaction, and we verify that the signature is cryptographically correct. Great. Then we just need to make sure that um, we're not creating uh, value out of thin air. We don't want to do that because we're trying to do a money here. So the value of the coin we're destroying is 19 bitcoins, and the two coins that we're creating are worth 10 and 9 bitcoins, respectively. So we've satisfied all these rules. This is officially a valid transaction. We will insert it, um, we'll, we'll, we'll use it to modify our database in this way. Uh, we destroy the coin 62A, and we create these two new coins, B2A and, and 13F. So on the top left is what the database used to look like. Then this transaction comes in. Now the database looks like it does on the right. One coin has been destroyed. Two new coins have been added. Um, okay, and that's how the Bitcoin database works. So there's a, there's a couple like loose ends about this that I wanted to, to tie up just to sort of wrap things up together. Um, we have concept of change from a transaction. So let's say Bart wants to pay Lisa 10 Bitcoin and he has a and he has control over a coin in the database worth 19 Bitcoin. What he does is he destroys that 19 BTC coin and creates two new coins. One is a 10 BTC coin that he sends to Lisa's pub public key and the other is a 9 BTC coin that he sends back to his own public key. Um, and that's where we have this change output. And if you look at Bitcoin transactions, which I'll show you in a second, you'll see this very common pattern where um, I'm paying you, I take a coin um, that I have and I, I break it into two coins and you get one and I get the other. And that's how change works. So instead of reducing your account balance by some amount, um, we're destroying you know, one coin, creating two new coins, but I still own one of those coins. Um, and the last thing is the coin challenge. And this is where Bitcoin is really exciting. Um, you don't have the challenge in my example is always signing with a public key and then you verify the cryptographic signature. And that's very, very common. Most Bitcoin transactions just do this. But um, the challenge can be much more interesting. It can be flexible. It can be called a smart contract even. Um, you can have a challenge that requires multiple signatures from different people or say, two people need to sign it out of a larger group of five people. Um, you can have challenges that aren't valid until a certain time in the future. Um, and you can put these things together to create exciting stuff like the Lightning Network, which I hope some of you have heard of and is a great thing to look up and, and learn about. But just to give you the idea that these public key signatures are not the only way to destroy coins and create new coins. They're not the only way to do transactions on Bitcoin. Um, and if you are going to look this up or, or talk to other smart people about Bitcoin, I just want to like tell you how um, Bitcoin developers are actually going to describe these things. When you destroy a coin, that's called an input to a transaction. And when you create a coin, that's called an output of a transaction. So Bitcoin transactions have inputs and outputs, and this is what they mean. The inputs are the coins you destroy, the outputs are the new coins you create. Um, I've been using the term coin a lot. Um, the, re the technical term is an unspent transaction output. That might make sense because you're creating coins. That, those are called transaction outputs and if they're unspent. So you know, we, it's the UTXO. The database is called the UTXO set. These are terms you um, might already recognize or are going to learn about um, as you learn more about Bitcoin. Um, the challenge in the database is actually called an output script. In the code, it's called a script pub key. Uh, the response is actually called an input script or a script sig. Sometimes it's called a witness. Um, these are just terms I want you to recognize as you learn more about Bitcoin. And um, the coin identifier is actually a, a hash of the transaction um, co combined with the output index of the transaction. So I don't really want to get too much into that, but I just want you to know um, what these words actually mean when you go um, start to learn more about them. 
Uh, here's a, a, a Bitcoin transaction I, I dug up off a of Block Explorer last week. You can kind of see what, they, what it actually looks like. The TXID is the first thing on the very top that's a hash of the transaction. That would be the identifier of the transaction. Um, VIN is uh, vector inputs. Those are the inputs to the transaction. These are the coins that are destroyed. Um, the TXID and the Vout is, is how the coin is identified in the database. Um, the script sig there would be the um, signature. And then we create two new coins at the bottom where it says V out. And you can see the script pub keys there as well. And you also might notice that there's um, an extra field here called script pub key underscore ASM. Um, and it looks a little bit more human readable. Hash 160, push bytes, op equal. And up here in the top, the script pub key in the input, you'll see this thing called check sig. So this is how challenges really look in the Bitcoin network. Um, challenges and responses, um, this is basically the equivalent of sign this identifier with this public key. And um, at the bottom, it's like, okay, here is my signature and stuff. Okay. Um, so we're done, right? We got asymmetric authentication cryptography to maintain a database of spendable coins that anyone can access. If a transaction is valid, we update our database. And transactions go to all Bitcoin servers on the internet. Um, so every Bitcoin server will be in sync, right? And we didn't forget anything, right? There's nothing wrong with this at all. We're done. Um, we got Bart and Homer and Lisa and Nelson, and they've all got a database that's in sync. And they've got this database of coins, and they can send transactions that destroy coins and create coins. And, um, and, uh, and that's done. We've created Bitcoin, right? So I'm going to check the chat really quick for any questions before moving on here. Is everybody OK so far? Okay. Okay, great. I must be explaining this super well. <laughs> um, okay, so there's actually something that we didn't cover here, and that is the truth. What is the truth? What if Nelson broadcasts two valid transactions that destroy the same coin, but they create two different sets of coins? Which one is real? Who did Nelson pay, Bart or Lisa? Um, who should give Nelson his coffee or his book or, or whatever he whatever he paid? Um, so let's say Nelson uh, has his private key uh, in red here. And he signs a transaction that destroys coin A and creates coin B. And coin B, let's say, goes to Bart. And he, he sends a transaction to Bart's computer. And Bart's like, great, I just got paid. Coin B has my public key, so Nelson just sent me money. But at the same time, Nelson creates an alternate transaction where he destroys the same coin, coin A, but this time he creates coin C, and he sends that to Lisa. And Lisa's like, oh, uh, coin C has my public key. Um, so Nelson must have just paid me. So what happened here? If, if Nelson had a coin worth 19 Bitcoins, he's just managed to spend it to two people at the exact same time. This isn't really how money works. So we need some way for Bart and Lisa to both know which of these transactions is real, maybe which one happened first. Um, so if the transaction to Bart happened first, Lisa will know that the transaction from Nelson is fake. It's not, it's not real. Um, if Lisa were aware of Bart's transaction, she would know that coin A has already been destroyed. And if we go way back, we'll see that one of the rules here is that um, the coin to be destroyed has to exist. Otherwise, the transaction is invalid. Okay, so at this point, what I've explained so far, both Bart and Lisa think coin A exists. So which one of these transactions is truth? Um, and here's where we're going to get into proof of work. And I, I hope I can explain this well enough because it's, um, it is a complicated thing. So... Uh, at the beginning of the talk, I, I mentioned hash functions. Um, an example of a hash function is called uh, SHA-256. It stands for Secure Hash Algorithm. Uh, 256 stands for how many bits its output is. So no matter what the input data, uh, a SHA-256 output will always be 32 bytes. If you take the hash of one character or the hash of an entire book, you're always going to get a 32-byte output. Remember that um, the output of a hash function is indistinguishable from random noise. It's like encrypting something with no key. It can't be reversed, and it just looks um, totally random. Um, the same input always produces the same output. Remember, I had a picture of Bart and Lisa both hashing the same data, and they got the same output. The function can absolutely not be reversed. If I show you a hash, there's absolutely no way you could possibly know what the input was. Um, we'll get to that a little bit. Um, uh, yeah, given a hash output, it's impossible to know what the input was. And an input-output pair can be verified by anyone very quickly. So if you say, hey, um, the hash of the letter A is this, I can verify that. I can hash the letter A and get the same output and be like, yes, you, congratulations, you have a working hash function on your computer. Um, so these are some actual examples of SHA-256. 
um, I started typing in the word Bitcoin slowly and every time I added a character, you can see that the SHA-256 output is completely different. All of these outputs look completely random. There's no pattern to them whatsoever. Uh, every time I just add a single letter, the entire hash changes a good deal. Um, and if I gave you one of these hashes, you'd probably have uh, n no way to know really what the input is. And again, I'm going to talk about that in a second. So all these hashes are completely different. But I do want to point out one thing, which is that the second hash here, BI, the, um, starts with 6B. And all the way down here, B-I-T-C-O-I, this input also starts with a 6B. So um, tiny little bits of these hashes um, are going to be are going to be the same, which makes sense because if you have enough completely random things, little parts of them are going to be similar, right? But clearly, the hash of bi and the hash of bitcoi are like otherwise vastly different, even though they start with the same byte. So let's say I gave you this hash, um, and I told you to tell me what the input was. What did I type in to get this hash? Um, I'll give you a hint. It's not Bitcoin or any word like that. And um, actually, we'd be here literally forever um, while everybody tries to figure out what the what I typed in to um, create this hash. In fact, mathematically speaking, it would take you two to the 256 random tries to find it. And that is just that's like end of the world type of computing power. That's like if you had all the energy in the universe multiplied by all the time the universe has been alive, you'd still never come close to even trying this many um, possibilities to see what input created this hash. So don't even bother, it's an impossible task. But what if I said, uh, find an input to a hash that, you know, what if we only care about the first byte? So give me any input where the hash starts with DA, kind of like back here in this table, if I said, give me a hash that starts with 6B, you'd have two options right away. And that's because um, one byte is only eight bits. So to find um, uh, a hash that starts with this exact byte, you only need two to the eighth attempts, 256 attempts. Um, imagine flipping a coin and getting tails eight times in a row. You could probably spend all day on that, but it would probably happen if you spend all day on it. Like it's it's not an impossible situation, and especially we have computers. If I said find me an input where the SHA-256 starts with DA, you'd find one probably instantly, literally, just so so fast. So somewhere between this two hundred uh, two to the two fifty six and this two to the eighth, um, you know, we're gonna try to like pinpoint something, um, and that's where Bitcoin comes in. We're gonna bring this back to Bitcoin here. So the hash that I have on the screen now is the actual Bitcoin block hash um, at height 666, uh, 666,208. So this is a block hash from last week when I was putting the slide together. Um, and you'll notice that the first uh, 19 bytes or so are all zeros. Now that is interesting. So what we have here is a partial collision of about 76 bits. That means that if I were to make a rule that says, hey, I want you to provide me some data that when I take the hash of it, it starts with 76 zero bits. And I don't care about the rest because I know it's gonna be impossible for you to find um, a hash that matches all 256 bits. But just to match the first 76 bits, um, this is still kind of a massive task if you think about it. Now I'm asking you to flip a coin 76 times and you getting tails every single time. If you were actually gonna to try to do that with an actual coin, it would probably take you 10 years or something. Um, I don't know, it'd take you some crazy amount of time, but it is still basically possible. Um, and so here are some actual numbers. The current Bitcoin network hash rate is this ridiculous number. It's 147 um, petahash or, or something. I don't even know, look at all those numbers. And it's that many hashes per second. That's how many times we were flipping a coin. Um, and even with all the computers on the Bitcoin network hashing away uh, at this astronomical rate, it still takes 10 minutes on average for one of those computers to find a piece of data that when hashed starts with 76 zeros. Um, so to accomplish this task, this 76 bit collision, it's very hard, it's very expensive, um, but it's possible. It just takes a long time, it takes the entire world 10 minutes to do it. Um, and once it's done, anybody can verify it instantly because if you just tell me what the data is, I can hash it one time. I will see that this hash is the same hash that you claim it is, and I know that you've done it. You found a piece of data that when hashed um, starts with, with 76 zeros, even though it took you, you know, five years to do it with a coin, 10 minutes to do it with an entire world full of computers. This is proof of work. 
I know that you must have done a lot of work to find the input um, to the hash function that produces uh, these 76 bits. Okay, so now we're gonna put this together with some transactions. Now we've got these um, transactions that we know um, can verify that like, uh, you know, yes, this is a valid transaction from Nelson. Nelson has money, he signed a message that's valid and he's sending the money to Bart. We got this list of transactions over here and now we've got this concept of proof of work and I'm gonna try to put them together um, in something called a block. So a block in Bitcoin is a list of transactions combined with the hash of the previous block and a nonce. And a nonce is a, a number used once. It's basically just a random number. The reason that the previous block hash is used is to create a chain. Um, and because like I said, uh, anytime you change the input to a hash function, you're gonna get an entirely different hash function. So there's no way for you to um, start uh, hashing a block um, you know, from the future. You can only really work on the very next block because you only know the current block. So you can only add a block to the chain because the current block is gonna be part of that input. It's gonna be part of the data that you put into the hash function to try to do that 76-bit collision. Um, every nonce uh, results in a completely different hash. Um, and if the hash starts with the right number of zero bits, the block is valid and you can broadcast it to the network and it'll be considered a valid message, just like an email with a from and a to field. Um, if a block is not valid, you ignore it. Um, maybe you ban that person from the network. Um, uh, valid blocks are also allowed to contain a special transaction that creates coins but does not destroy any coins, which means there is a way to increase the money supply in Bitcoin, but it requires, um, it requires proof of work. These coin-based transactions uh, are only allowed in blocks, and so the only way to generate new coins um, is by uh, you know, satisfying this proof of work function. And like, so find the right knots, go. And, and this is how Bitcoin works. Miners all around the world are taking transactions and taking the hash of the previous block and putting it together with um, a counter. And they're going zero, one, two, three, four, five. And they're trying every single number they possibly can, um, putting it into the hash function and looking at the hash output. And if it starts with enough zeros, they have successfully found a block and they can broadcast that to the network. Um, so in this illustration, I've got uh, three blocks. Um, and each one includes the hash of the previous block. So the first block uh, is block zero. We can call that the Genesis block. Um, and the hash of that block is 00B1CC. Uh, starts with a couple of zeros. The next block, you'll notice, um, starts with that hash. 00B1CC is part of the data we need to hash, uh, the, the previous block hash. And then we add some more transactions and a nonce, and we get a new hash, 000AC2. And then that hash goes into block two, and we had more transactions and a nonce, and now the hash of block two is 0000 B4. Um, and this is the blockchain. This is how proof of work uh, links these chunks of data together. Um, so now I'm gonna introduce an, another concept called chain work. Um, and one way to think about chain work is the total number of zero bits in the hash of every block on the blockchain. And remember, finding a hash with these zero bits is a hard thing to do. So the more zero bits you can find, um, the harder it must have been to put that entire chain together. Um, so I've got these three blocks here. The first block starts with 0F112F. Um, that hash starts with four bits. So we'll call that a chain work of four. The second block also starts with 0F and then 11CC. That's another four zero bits. Now we're up to a total of eight for the whole blockchain. The third block starts with 00FFC2. That 00 is eight more zero bits. We add it to the total, now we've got 16 bits. So if we were to look at the block on the far right, the third block, we could say that that blockchain has 16 bits of chain work. And you can see as we go from left to right, every time we add a block to the chain, the total chain work goes up. So now we're gonna bring this back to The Simpsons. Um, Nelson has these two transactions that both destroy the same coin, meaning one of them must be invalid. One creates coin B for Bart, the other creates coin C for Lisa. Which one is true? Okay, so recall that these blocks contain transactions um, and nonces and all this hash and stuff, and hopefully this is starting to come together. And um, this, is, this is sort of an unusual picture. So what I have here is a chain, but it looks like two chains. So what is actually happening here? On the left, we start with a block, and then uh, immediately after that, there are two blocks. 
that each have the um, the same that that both point to uh, uh, that both point to the same uh, block on the left. And actually, I'm realizing that I no no this is still right. It's just right. It's just a little it's a little messed up actually. Um, I'm gonna change this. Let's see. Okay, I'm, I realize that I have made a mistake on this slide, but um, I'll tell you what the mistake is, or maybe if someone can figure it out, um, uh, I would be very pleased. But basically, like this, this the second block on the top and the bottom should have the same previous hash because they're both pointing to the same block. Anyway, so I'll just get to the point. We have two blockchains here. One of them contains transaction I, which is the transaction on the left here to Bart. The other contains transaction N, which is the transaction on the right, that one goes to Lisa. Um, and uh, the chain on the top has a total chain work of 28 bits, and the chain on the bottom um, has a total chain work of 16. And this is just because uh, the chain on the top has got three extra blocks to it. The miners have done all this extra work, and the chain on the bottom um, hasn't. There have only been two blocks added to that chain, and then maybe the miners gave up on it, and they started working on this other chain. So the, the big point here is that there are um, two blockchains, one has more chain work than the other. One contains transaction I and the other contains transaction N. And that's it. That's how we do it. We find the chain with the most accumulated work. So Lisa knows that transaction N is invalid because her Bitcoin software has received the blockchain where coin A has already been destroyed. It's already been destroyed in transaction I. Uh, and that the, this chain has more accumulated chain work than the alternative chain. So Lisa might even know about these two chains, um, but she doesn't care about the chain with transaction uh, N because it doesn't have as much chain work as the chain with transaction I. Um, so the answer is Bart has these coins. Lisa does not. Lisa can, um, uh, can tell Nelson that his transaction is invalid and that his money uh, is no good at, at her store. Um, and because Lisa is following the blockchain with the most accumulated proof of work, her database is in sync with everybody else's database. In, her, in Lisa's database, coin A has been destroyed, and so she knows that Nelson's transaction is a fraud. So bring it all the way back to the beginning, um, when we're talking about Bitcoin is a computer program that, that sends messages out on the network. Um, that computer program is called the full node. And here we go. The purpose of a full node is to connect to other Bitcoin full nodes on the internet and exchange messages like transactions and blocks in order to maintain for the user a database that matches the database of every other Bitcoin full node. We want everybody's database to be exactly the same. And when a user's node is in sync, they can send and receive Bitcoin transactions with confidence um, that the money that they've received has been spent. So Lisa knows that um, coin C doesn't really exist. Nobody is gonna gonna accept Lisa's transaction if she tries to spend coin C. It's not real. It's invalid because um, this transaction was never valid. Um, so I, I y yes, sir. Okay. Fantastic. Because I'm um, I'm I'm on my last slide anyway. Okay. So let's talk about this. Why is the hash going to the next block? And what is the nonce? Okay, great. Please, uh, chain of transactions that makes black vomit. Okay, so why is the hash going to the next block? And the reason for that is to to make this into a chain. I'll go back to uh, to this slide. So if I were just to give you a list of transactions and a nonce, you could hash it, and you could and you could say like, oh, okay, yes. Um, the hash of this data has starts with seventy six zero bits, and therefore it's a valid block. Um, but that doesn't solve the problem of which transaction happened first. So by taking the hash of the previous block and adding it to the data in the next block, we create a chain. Or actually in this case, you can see there's actually a fork. You can even have multiple chains. But every new block must point to the previous block. And what that does is it gives us um, uh, ordering. It, it, that's how we know what happened first. Um, uh, so we know when a transaction is valid and when coins have been destroyed um, and like that. If Does that make sense, uh, Q? Do you want, uh, let me know if that, if that didn't um, answer your question. Okay, great. And uh, what is a nonce? So a nonce in, in, I guess, crypto terms is a shorthand for a number used once. Uh, it's basically a random number, or I described it as a counter. Um, but when we're, when we're putting a block together, we know we're gonna have two things, a list of transactions, um, which we can't change because they've been signed, 
and we're going to have the hash of the previous block, which we can't change because we have to do this thing in a, in a chain. But we need some way to um, change the input data to get different hashes. We need still need some way to um, to try different combinations of data until we find a hash that satisfies our goal. And that's what the nonce is. So you take the hash of the previous block, you take your list of transactions, and then you add a, a bit of random data to it. And you try a, a, this data and that data and different random data, and you try a zero and a one and a two and a three, and you go as fast as you can, trying as many nonces as you can. Every time you change the nonce, you're gonna get a completely different hash. And eventually, if you're lucky, and you're trying hard enough, you're doing enough work, you will find a hash um, that satisfies the target with the number of zeros. Um, did that make sense, Q? Awesome. Um, essentially, please chain with transactions as more blocks makes it valid. Okay, so this is actually, this is a good question too. Does the chain with um, more transactions or has more blocks make it valid? This is a good question because this is something that Satoshi got wrong in the white paper. Um, in Satoshi's white paper, he does mention that the longest chain, the chain with the most blocks, is the valid chain, is the true chain. Um, and in fact, I could be wrong about this, but I'm, I'm pretty sure actually the very first um, Bitcoin like version 0.1 that Satoshi actually released followed this rule. But it's not actually a very good rule um, because the target changes uh, over time. So I was telling you that you need to hit 76 zero bits to create a valid block. That's not really true. The number 76 might be true for one block, but that difficulty will change over time. Um, and um, it's a little complicated to explain, but, but let's just say that when Bitcoin started, you didn't need to hit 76 bits. You only needed to hit, let's say five. So when Satoshi started mining the first blocks back in 2009, it was a lot easier to find those blocks. And nowadays it's a lot harder. So um, if I used the target of five bits instead of 76 bits, it'd be a lot easier to find blocks. So you can imagine, um, since that's so easy, I could right now with my laptop create a blockchain that is a million blocks long, but each of those blocks is hitting um, an easier target and um, that's not good proof of work. So that's why we, uh, instead of talking about the longest chain, we talk about the chain with the most accumulated proof of work. Um, I hope that makes sense. Uh, this is what a minor change to get a new hash. Yes, yes. Essentially, um, great because chain to TXI has more blocks make it valid. Yeah, so uh, yeah, so that's what I was saying. It, it's, it's not about which chain has the most blocks, it's about which one has the most accumulated proof of work. It's a, it's a subtlety. Um, with the new IA that makes prediction easy, can't the hash be predicted? This is an, uh, another good question. Um, so the answer is no, and that's because, um, so actually I can take this back to, um, back to the, the cryptography slide. Um, we're talking about the different types of cryptography. Um, symmetric encryption, asymmetric encryption, authentic and asymmetric authentication. Or actually, let's just talk about the asymmetric um, stuff. So the asymmetric encryption and asymmetric authentication, meaning like the signature stuff, uses math. It uses something called elliptic curve mass, math and um, uh, prime order fields and group operations and all this cool stuff where numbers really do really amazing things. And because it's math, um, a supercomputer or a quantum computer, I don't know about AI exactly, but because it's math, there is potential for um, a quantum computer with enough co quantum computing power to actually fake a signature or reverse um, a, a certain type of encryption. It's nothing to worry about yet. Um, the signatures used in Bitcoin are 256 bits. Uh, wait, is that right? Let's, let me just say, because I don't want to get this wrong. Let's just say that, that, that security in Bitcoin is about 256 bits. Um, and the quantum computers that exist this year in 2020 have something like three bits or like five bits. So we're a long way away from um, encryption being broken. Um, when it comes to the hash functions though, hash functions are different because they don't actually use math. A hash function is like, putting a tree in a wood chipper and then setting the wood chips on fire and then mixing that with like a bunch of chemicals and then taking a single drop and being like, okay, what did the tree look like that made this drop? Um, there's no way to reverse that. Um, so 
when it comes to quantum computing and AI, the hash functions, as far as I know, um, and I would, I would love uh, for somebody to send me an email and, and correct me on this because I want to be totally sure. Um, but when it comes to hash functions, quantum computing and artificial intelligence is not a threat. But when it comes to um, the signatures and um, encryption, then yes, we do need to worry about quantum computing and um, AI possibly, but not for many years. Um, so that's a good question. Okay, anyone else? Um, does, it, does this make sense? Did anybody, did, did anybody learn something or at least understand something in a, in a new way? Maybe that you can explain it to somebody? Sure. Oh. <laughs> oh my God! Stop! No! 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 <laughs> okay, I'll send them. Okay, I'll put them in the chat right here, and um, I'll also uh, tweet them, and I'll give them to Joseph, and and um, we can pass them around that way. Yeah, I, I've been, <laughs> I am blushing. Um, I recorded this meeting. I'm going to try to put it on YouTube. I'll also put my email address uh, here in the chat and um, um, and I'll, I'll tweet it out also and I'll hand it to Joseph so that you guys can all get a, get a hold of me and find different ways to contact me and we can um, talk more about it. 